My name is Dr. John Carr. I um, have a great passion for pigs and uh, population medicine. I grew up working on a pig farm and I would probably argue I learned more about pigs uh, between 11 and 18 than I have since. Almost everything I've learned since, I have to admit, has uh, mainly come from my clients. Uh, as a veterinarian, my job is to be a conduit for somebody other, other people's ideas. But certainly for um, the last uh, 25 years, I have dedicated my life to looking at um, pigs as a speciality. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to tour the world and look at pig farming systems, hot, cold, dry and wet, all over this planet. The presentation we have is going to be on looking at the gilt and its introduction to the farm. The key to the whole presentation is that gilts are the fuel that runs the farm. You've got to understand this uh, foundation concept. Once you realize that the gilts, managing the gilt pool is what matters, then what you have to do is determine how many gilts you need. And the talk will discuss uh, how many gilts we need in order to proficient, proficiently and economically uh, manage your uh, pig farm. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here today and uh, I'm very pleased um, and honored that uh, Siva has asked me to talk to you guys today. I'm going to just lower this a little bit because I'm getting a lot of echo. Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I would say I'm very pleased to be here and thank you very much for inviting me. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, methods to try and improve the productivity of the farm and concentrating on uh, gilt uh, development. Um, and like a lot of the speakers, I also have a lot of slides and I'm also, I'm already anticipating probably going over my time. But anyway, we will try and keep to, we'll try and keep to time. Following on from what Nicholas was talking about, one of the most important aspects, I believe, of designing a farm or running a farm nowadays is achieving all in all out. The only thing, you, and with, with particularly with Asia, where we still have quite a lot of pathogens, we must put pigs into clean buildings. And we must try and break some of these um, pathogen flows around our farms. It's important, therefore, to try and have a batch system. If you don't have, if you don't have a batch system, you don't do all in all out. As Nicholas clearly showed on his Danish farm, one of the problems is they, don't, they cannot achieve all in all out. They will honest, they'll think they do, but if you, if you only have 314 farrowing crates and you have 360 sows, somebody has to cheat. You're either stealing pigs from the previous week or you're trying to farrow animals early in the next week. And this then leads to, class classically with purse problems, but it will also just lead to lack of all in all out. So the first thing I have to do in order to, to know how many gilts I'm going to need is design a pig flow model. And this is a, a, a wordy slide, but the, one of the problems with the word batching, the Americans have taken the word batching to imply some sort of multiple system. The reality is all farms batch. It just depends on what you mean by one interval to the next. So for instance, it could be twice a week, but that would be, when, that would be Monday and Thursday that throws the problem off automatically because now you've got a three-day batch with a four-day batch, so there's two uneven batches. Or the classic one in Europe is we would batch once a week uh, at 28 days um, or at 21 days if you're uh, elsewhere in the world. But in Europe, we've also experimented with other batching systems. So for instance, it's now very popular in Europe to batch in every three weeks. So every three weeks you wean every three weeks you farrow, every three weeks you uh, breed. So for instance, if you were a 10 sow a week farm, which is about a 240, 250 sow unit, now you're doing a 30 sows. So instead of being a 250 sow unit farrowing 10 sows a week, you are now a 250 sow unit farrowing every three weeks 30 sows. This has given you a big opportunity. You are now a 750 sow unit albeit only every three weeks. But it allows you the concept of scale. So instead of having just 10 pigs, or ha having 100 pigs, for instance, to be weaned, I now have 300 pigs to be weaned. And one of the major drivers of, of, of me doing batching to start off with was actually the sick pig, or the compromised pig. So for instance, if we take a week where we have 10 sows a week, 
we, we wean a hundred pigs, ten of those pigs are going to be small. The trouble with ten pigs is it's easy to ignore them. They just get put in a corner, they get put in a bit of a pen, and you end up just not putting enough attention into them. Now if you did the same farm every three weeks, now I have 30 pigs, 300 pigs being weaned, now I have 30 pigs that are compromised. That's a pen. With 30 pigs, I'm actually willing to do something with them. And so one of the reasons for batching, and one of the reasons for batching to be successful, is the fact that it produces you enough small pigs that it's actually worth your while to go ahead and do something with them. And the small pigs are important, as we'll, as we'll see. <coughs> You can edit that out, Colin, I think. The, you, you, the small pigs are important, as we'll see, particularly with, when you're concerned with the guilt pool, because a lot of the small pigs come out of the guilt pool. And in, the, and in America, and in places where we're allowed to wean at 21 days, which would include uh, all of Asia, then one option is actually a four-week batch. So this takes the whole firing room. So with a four-week batch, I need one firing room. So, for instance, if you have 47 firing crates, which is a prime number, 47 firing crates means you can't do weekly systems because there's, there's not a, there's four isn't divisible, isn't divisible by four, it isn't divisible by five. You can't do a, a two-week system. Uh, uh, you can't half it because 47 is not divisible by two. But if you could, you can make a four-week batch system, which means I use all 47 firing crates. But the downside is you will be weaning at... 20 days. That just means you need a better quality nursery. And with respect to most of Asia, our nurseries are not good enough to do three-week weaning. This talk is, I haven't got the time to go through designing a batch firing farm, um, but if those of you who are interested in and need some help, we, we, from some, we have some stuff on the website, and you can certainly send Jerry and my, or myself an email, and we'll sort of help you work through some of the exercises. And maybe um, uh, Craig and I can write a paper to try and explain how to do this uh, in Asia. Okay, one of the drivers as well for um, designing a flow model is actually the space required for your finishing pigs. And in Asia, one of the compromises we have of heat is that our finishing pigs often need a lot more space. So for, for instance, a 110 kilogram pig in uh, Thailand I would normally recommend one square meter per pig. From a European point of view, I'd recommend 0.65 square meters. Now this means you cannot compare European data with Thai data. It's unfair. You are having to give 30% more space. Therefore, you have to produce 30% more less pigs. So your cost of production is slightly different. And you need to be very careful when you compare information coming out of Denmark with information coming out of Vietnam and then saying, oh my god, the Vietnamese industry is so awful. That's not necessarily true. It's not necessary. You have to be very careful how you look at some of these numbers. I must also point out the Danish industry is going bankrupt. So if you wish to follow the Danish industry, we will go to bankruptcy. I mean, it is a serious concern. We push, we push 30, 32, 33, 34 pigs per sale per year. The European industry is bankrupt because all that happens is the slaughterhouse pays you less and less and less per pig. You do not get the same profit. If you're making money at 16 pigs per sale per year, do not expect to make double the profit on 32. You'll probably make less. And it is a warning against Asia. Asia can very rapidly rush into European genetics. You have to make sure you make a profit. That's the purpose of pig farming, not doing 32 pigs per sale per year. Europe, Northern European industries are struggling, despite our excellent performance. So it comes down to here. These are actually Canadian um, data. Um, so I'm, I would give my pigs one square meter. But this allows me then to design my farms because I have a very fixed amount of space. So the first thing that I do when I go to a farm in order to figure out how many pigs am I going to produce is I would measure it. Hardly anybody knows how big their bloody farm is. Well, if you don't know how big your farm is, how do you know how many pigs to put in it? And this simple exercise 
You ask a lot of people, how big a farm have you got? I have no idea. Ask them how many sows they've got. Oh, I'm a thousand sow unit. What does that mean? Do you have any space to put them? And we have this passage, we have this pen, but what about the passageway? Do you include the passageway in the building? Majority of passageways are anywhere between 12 and 15, 16% of your total floor area. Passageways are important because one of the things that's going to happen in Asia is you're going to have to start weaning 12. I might not like everything coming out of Denmark, but what they have taught us is how to wean at least 12 pigs. If you're weaning 12, 10 today and 12 tomorrow, that's 20% more pigs. Where are you going to put them? Because you're not going to build another finishing building. You're going to have to figure out where to put these pigs. So, I need to know the space, the total space I have. I need to know how much space I'm going to give each pig. If that's Taiwan, if that's Taiwan in the middle of the summer, it's too many pigs. Those pigs are going to really struggle. We're going to have a major APP outbreak because the, the pigs have got nowhere to go. I need to, know the, I, know, I need to know the finishing weight. I need to know the time it takes me to get to the finishing weight so I can work out how many pigs I need to wean each batch. Each batch. Not a week, not two, just it's all about each batch. Once I know how many, sow, how many pigs I'm going to wean, I'm going to work out how many pigs Pig, piglets I need to wean, I can then work out how many sows I'm going to need and that will then tell me how many pigs I need to breed. And as Nicholas pointed out in his presentation, the number of pigs we breed, we must start becoming a lot more consistent than the way we've done it before. And I'll talk a bit about that. Space, space, finishing rate, number of pigs to wean, the firing rate. And then you put, you make a little calculation up, so I have on this farm it's an imaginary farm, 741 square meters of finishing space. I have one, one meter per, per pig. I have, I'm going to kill 5% of the pigs. Now, if you notice, I don't use the word post weaning mortality. One of the things in Asia as well you have to learn from the Europeans, you have to think about your language. We've been very careless with our language. And you, we're gonna, you're gonna, you are going to have people question your business. So I don't talk about mortality rates. Mortality rate is awful. I mean, a 1% mortality rate is awful. You mean you lose a pig? You mean you put pigs into this building and they die? How can you sell that to the public? So instead of using mortality rate, Jerry and I have come up with the concept of having finishing rates or nursery rates. I have 95% of my pigs finished. Oh, that sounds quite good. I don't put sows in a farring crate. A crate in English means something that's small, confining, difficult to turn around in. I have farrowing places. When I was a boy, we raised pigs in flat decks. I now raise pigs in nurseries. Because a nursery is a nice term. I don't sell drugs. Well, apart from a th Thursday night behind the railway station. But I don't sell drugs. I use medicines. Because medicines is something that's nice. Where drugs are, ref are reflected as something that's horrible that you see on cops. OK, so we put these numbers into the system. I'm weaning 12 per firing crate because I bought into the Danish concept with a 12 per, per, per firing place. I have a firing rate of 82. How many sows do I need to breed? 79.3 in order to fill that space. Fantastic. And you see this number in textbook after textbook after textbook. <clears throat> What's wrong with it? Oh, he actually wants us to participate in this conference. What's wrong with 79.3? It's not legal to mate the back leg. You, you can't mate one third of the pig and ignore the other two thirds. I mean, a dog might try to do that, but most of the time, most of us would consider it is not legal. You've got to round it up. You can't round it down because if you round it to 79, every three weeks, every three batches, you're going to have an empty firing crate. Can't afford to do that. So the number has to be 80. You must round up. And this is a major problem that the pig industry has. It works on too many averages. 
And it says, on average, I'm doing well. Bullshit. Averages are, are meaningless. You must learn to crop the batch of pigs. What I mean by that is you put the seeds in, you let them grow, and then you harvest the crop. But you don't take the next field to say, well, that's, this crop's a little bit down, so I'm going to take the next field. Averages. What does the word average mean? Well, I've got one foot in boiling water and one foot in freezing water. On average, I'm okay. And that describes the average pig on this planet. And one little plea about Asia, will you please stop forgiving yourself for poor production by saying it's hot. It's hot in Spain. If any of you have watched My Fair Lady, it's hot in Spain. The rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain. It is hot in Spain and it's bloody humid at times. <clears throat> but the Spanish can get good production. <clears throat> I appreciate it's hot. I appreciate it's humid. humid. Learn to farm it. It is not an excuse. I'm perfectly capable of farming all over this planet with exactly the same output. Do not use an excuse. If the bores are too hot, as I said this morning, air condition the building. <clears throat> you may have more costs. That's not the argument. As veterinarians, we need to just farm the building. We have two farmers. We have two farmers. Mark has a 90% firing rate. John has an 84% firing rate. Who's the better farmer? So Mark has a 90% firing rate, John has an 84% firing rate. Instinctively, who thinks Mark is the better farmer? Instinctively, okay. I'll make another proviso. We have a 250 sow unit, so that's a family farm, typical family farm. Who's the better farmer? Who thinks Mark's the better farmer? Hands up, 90%. Who's who thinks 90% is better than 84 should be all of you. Okay. And this is important when you actually look at data. What have I done with my phone? This is important when you actually look at data. Because a lot of data is presented to you with the implication that we've improved the firing rate. And therefore, things are marvelous. So if you take your phone, we've got on this farm, we're going to farrow 10 sows a week. So you take your phone, <coughs> and what we'll do is we'll do 10 sows, and we'll divide it by 90%. So how many sows do Mark, does Mark have to, fat, have to breed? 11.1. How many sows does Mark have to breed? 12. If it's, illegal to f if it's illegal to make one third of a pig, it's equally illegal to make just the foot. If it's 11 point anything, the answer is 12. 10 divided by 0 0.84 is, how many sows does John have to breed? How many sows does, 10? 12. 12. I can't mate 11.9. I, I mate 12. On a small family farm, the, there is no difference between 90 and 84%. The numbers are 7 percentage points insensitive. That should be quite shocking to most of you. It is exactly the same farm. We're two brothers living on the same farm. He has a funny accent, but that's his mother. The, we are two brothers living on the same farm. He is an optimist, and he sees 90%, and I'm English, being a pessimist. I used to be European. Oh, just the beginning of the week. <laughs> now I'm English again, so now I'm a pessimist. So I see 84. What will the computer produce? The computer will produce 86, because it's the number that's in between the two of us. It has nothing to do with reality. It's all about numbers. 86 is considered a good firing rate because we all grew up on small family farms because the number is the middle point between our two numbers. And 78 is considered a bad firing rate 
because it's the numbers that are, are down, because 84 goes to 76, and the number in between is 7980. You have been conned for 50 years about use of firing rates. You must be very critical. So when you look at data, and the data changes from 82 to 86, be very careful how many sours they did it over. Those numbers are probably meaningless. While Mark is here, another small consideration <coughs> of don't trust, the pick, don't trust numbers. We're all very guilt, we're all vet, most of us are veterinarians. You've got to be very critical of what your clients are telling you. So Mark has an 8% pre-weaning mortality, pre-weaning mortality. I have a 12% pre-weaning mortality. Who's the better farmer? So, instinctively, who thinks that Mark, with an 8% pre-weaning mortality, is better than a 12? Okay, most of us would try to drive the 8%. But you've not asked the right question. Because Mark weans 9. I wean 11. So, Mark works really, really hard, and he gets his pre-weaning mortality down to 5%. Bloody fantastic except the fact he's still only weaning nine and a half. Of course, what Mark has is genetic problems, as you can clearly see. <laughs> On his farm, no, it's not personal. I mean, I've got more hair. <laughs> Mark's problem is that he hasn't got enough total born to lose. So Mark's 8% means that he goes bankrupt, because in He's on the edge of Denmark, and the Danes are pushing all his pigs out and reducing the price. So with Mark's nine and a half, he just can't do. But we're mates. And so what I do is I know that he's a better stockman than me, so I'll employ him to work on my farm. And he will then drive my 12% down to 8%, and now I'm winning 12. You see the, see the way you look at the numbers? Mark's 8% was a disaster. It gave him no room to maneuver. It meant he was going to go bust. My 12% was fantastic because I was already weaning 11. It gave me room to improve that number and go closer to the 12, to weaning 12. What an interesting world when 12% pre-weaning mortality is better than an 8% pre-weaning mortality. You must ask the right question. As veterinarians, we must ask the right question. May I give a hand of warm applause to my able assistant. <laughs> Be very careful as veterinarians to ask the right question. Well, some of these get complicated. As well, you've, I mean, one of the things you've got to play sometimes with numbers, and that's about how you cull sows. So for instance, on my farms, and I have to watch about the time, so I'm going to not necessarily tell too much of a story. On my farms now, I only cull at preg check. I cull at six weeks, and then I cull, if necessary, at farrowing. Because if you cull at weaning, which is what most of our clients do, if you cull at weaning, you have not guaranteed your breeding number. If, on the other hand, though, you do cull at preg check, you've got to be careful that you don't apparently drive down this mystical farrowing rate because clearly these animals have been bred, and, and then when they're pulled out, because they're, they're pulled out from a management point of view, I've driven the firing rate down. But if it's a management decision, you've got to, put, you've got to make sure how you read the numbers to make sure you get the result that you want. OK, so how can batching help my farm? One of the things in it helps this concept of empty firing rate, firing rate costs. This is the new reality for Asia. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And how many of you noticed that was the leg of the sow? But anyway, the new reality for Asia has got to be 12. What I want to try and do now, just to illustrate a point from Nicholas's talk. And again, I need a little bit of audience participation. So this is a farrowing crate. So 
Who's Ty? Who's Ty in the room? Who wants to admit to being Ty? <laughs> I have some very good friends who are Ty. What's wrong with being Ty? Is nobody Ty? You didn't invite anybody from Thailand? What I need to know, who is Ty? Come on, put your hand up. Who's Ty? Right. What I need to know, you're going to have to shout at me. What is the current income per kilogram in Thailand? How much money? Use the microphone. Where's the microphone? Why don't you ask it to me? We are here. <laughs> I, need to know the, I need to know the income and I need to know the cost of a kilo, of, of how much it costs you. I mean, just, just roughly. And then I need to know the percentage of that is feed. So what is the, what is the current income per kilogram in Thailand? Twenty-five baht. Twenty-five baht. Seventy-five. Okay, seventy-five baht. And how much is it roughly is the cost of production? Sixty-five. Should we make it sixty-five? About fifty, even better. And and how much of how much of your costs are food? Sixty-five, seventy percent. Seventy. Seventy. Okay. So what we have is we have a sow and piglets. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say we are we are an Asian farm. We went to that fantastic Siva reproduction meeting, and we went from weaning eight to weaning 12, and we are so grateful to Siva, and we will promise to always buy Siva product. Anyways, but anyway, the, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have 12 pigs, and, and what's the live weight? 110 kilos? What's the weight of a finishing pig? 110? 105? How many? 105, okay. So when you do this calculation, and, and that is per kilo, so what you have then is that the profit is going to be 75 minus 50 bar times 105 times 12. You agree? So because that farrowing crate is empty, we have whoops, 25 times 105 times 12, 25 times 105 times 12. So we have 31,500 bar profit. OK? So if that farrowing crate is empty, and we practice all in, all out. So we're just doing one batch after the next. We're going to lose 31,500 bar. Is that the real cost of that empty farrowing crate? Why is it not the real cost of that farrowing crate? The reason it's not the real cost of the farrowing crate is that the only thing you save with those pigs is the food. Yes? If you don't have those pigs on the farm, you don't have to feed them. But the lights stay on. The water bill stays the same. The vet bill stays the same, by and large. The labor bill will stay the same. The consultant bill, which is even more expensive than the vet bill, will stay the same. So what you've got is you've got 30% of that 15. So you've got cost, which is 15 times 0 0.3, which is 15 bar per kilogram per pig 
loss. So that's 15 times 105 times 12. So there's another 18,900 cost implication. So that's 31,500. That empty firing crate is costing you 50,000 bar per turn. You agree? Or you, you can see where my numbers come from. Yes? So, when you go to your client's farms tomorrow, try this. Oh, well, on Monday, because I'm tomorrow you're having a holiday. Empty firing crate, 50,000. Empty firing crate, 100,000. Oh, a third one, 150,000. Fantastic. And you get, and your clients say that you're expensive? This is a primary, primary role for a veterinarian. You must save your clients that money. That's more important, that's more important than purse, more important than PCV2, it's more important than some few pigs that drop dead of glasses disease. Every empty firing crate is 12 pigs. 50, 100, 150,000 bar, and that's only three crates. You think Ultrasine's too expensive? Seriously, this is why we farm pigs. This, or this is why your clients farm pigs, and you need to understand it. And everything I do on the farm relates to this. Because this is the easiest way I can make my clients money. If I, keep my, if I make my clients money, my clients will stay in business. This is why guilt pool management matters. Because guilt pool management is about filling that firing crate. Everybody forgets the cost of production, the fixed cost of production. It is the most critical part of the farm. If you want to be a successful swine consultant, job number one, fill the farm, cover the costs. It's actually not much more complicated than that. Oh, at some point you maybe treat some diseases, but fill the farm. So how do we fill the farm? One of the ways we do it is we use these breeding boards so that I can actually see what the hell is going on. The target here is I want to wean 40 sows a week. See, I want to wean 40 sows a week. We talk about farrowing rates. I want to wean 40 sows. I don't care how many sows farrow. Why does it matter? I want 40 sows to wean. If 44 sows farrow, I steal her babies. What matters is when 39 sows farrow, it's impossible to wean 40. But the number of sows that farrow is actually not relevant to a modern pig farm. What matters is having all the crates full at the point of weaning. We have to breed 50 in order to wean the 40. I want 46 pregnant. And the reds imply when animals fall out the system. And so it's very important for me that after week five, when we preg check, that I want basically no reds in this system. And any week when we are below target, it is blue. So one of the things you can see to start off with is there's no blues. That's a good farm. And then what I can do is I can try and understand what are these reds? Are they you know, abortions? Did they die? Some reasons I can accept culling. I can't accept culling if it means that we end up with not enough sows. So that's a weekly system. And the number of sows on the farm currently, because, sorry, one of the things about this board, that because those at the back can't see it properly, this is the weeks of gestation. This board is a little bit unusual because it also includes the lactation. And that's where a lot of pig flow model, a lot of pig programs fail. They look at the breeding pool and they look at the firing pool as two separate numbers. They are the same number. What matters to me, I'm a breeding guy. 
What matters to me is having 50 sows this week and in 21 weeks' time having 50 sows again. I'm a breeding guy. I don't care how many sows farrow. I don't care how many go pigs go to the nursery. I don't care how many pigs are in the finishing. It's not my problem. It's somebody else's problem. Unless you make it part of the team. This number here is the number of sows that are currently present on the farm. Total sows. So I can very rapidly do total sow inventory based on these boards. They're very difficult to lie. And I would encourage you as veterinarians to seriously think about adopting something like this so that you actually know what your clients are doing. This is a three-week batch program. This, that one is in China. This one is a three-week batch program in England using an Italian board, but say la vie. And so what you see here is with it being a three-week batch program, we still have recording the things weekly. We're recording events weekly, but we're recording um, the events are also over the week system. Now, when you combine all of these, what you have is a graph that's very similar to the one Nicholas showed you, where we have a farm in chaos over this point, and then with progression uh, using um, pig flow management, we're able to get to a point where now, instead of having the example that Nicholas used was around 40%, some of my farms when I first go on are even worse, nearly 60% variance around the mean. We also changed our targets in here, but anyway, what we now have is a variance of 5%. My target is 5%. So when, he, when my target is 12, 12 to breed, it will be 12, 13, 12, 13, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 14, 13, 12, 12. It will never be 11. And it'll most certainly never be 9. Because there's no bloody way I can farrow 10 pigs with only nine sows. And then in my reports, I can write information down uh, about what these boards mean. What I should have said to start off with is the blue, if you can read it, the blue line is breeding, the red line is farrowing, and the green line is weaning. And the one thing you can tell with these lines is they basically follow each other. I mean, it kind of makes sense. The more pigs you breed, the more pigs you'll farrow, the more pigs you'll wean. The impact of variation in weaning, in farrowing rate, is actually quite small. We have a big change there. The farrowing rate is much lower than normal. The weaning numbers are much lower than normal. The reason was I added a lot of gilts. The farm is, is running out of animals, so I added a lot of gilts. Gilts have a lower farrowing rate. Gilts will also have more scour, as Nicholas said. And so therefore, I weaned less, I farrowed less. What I should have done is bred up to here in order to hit my targets but the farm was learning. So, when do I need my gilts? Well, one of the other big advantages of these boards is it allows me to tie my gilts better. Now, everybody can have your own view on the world. I like breeding my gilts on their third estrus, uh, post boar exposure. Some people like to do the second, and I agree entirely with Nicholas. I, don't want to, I wouldn't wait till my fourth. The reason I, I would do my third is because with my third estrus, I can have more gilts. If I do my second estrus and I have, say, six gilts in my gilt pool, if I do wait till my third, I now have 12. And it just means that I can more likely to guarantee hitting my target. What interests me with uh, altrazine is that maybe I can save on some of those gilts because I have more control. At the moment, I'm relying on nature to do it. If I took more control, maybe I could have less. But anyway. We have four weeks of lactation. We have then the gestation board. On my concept of my third estrus, I introduce my gilts to the boar. She cycles, that takes a week. Then three weeks later, she will have an estrus, so there's four. Three weeks after that, she will have another estrus, so that's seven. So let's assume we have a little bit of a cock up, that's closer to nine. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So week 12, week 13, of gestation, you need the gilts to get into the gilt pool. Therefore, in week 10 and 11, you need to check and order the gilts. How many people in this room order gilts week 10 and 11 of gestation? I could probably argue almost nobody. We order our gilts on the day of weaning, and we expect them to be ready four days later because we have not planned the farm. 
So when I walk the farm on day week 11 and 11, 10 and 11, there's Craig, a bit lame. Maybe he needs to go. There's Mark. Well, we've heard about Mark's genetic problems. You know, he maybe needs to go. There's John, big tit. Well, she probably needs to go. You know, there's Alan. He's a, she's a little bit um, old. She needs, so I need four extra gilts. And then, actually, the gilts don't have the same firing rate, so I probably need five. I need five extra gilts to hit the pool. I need to buy five extra gilts on top of my normal gilt pool so that I can then, if I have to, cull out my sows. How many gilts do I need? The gilts are the fuel that runs the farm. I end the talk on that. If you think of nothing, if you remember nothing else about this entire talk I'm giving, if you remember that one conversation, the gilts are the fuel that runs the farm. It's the only part of the farm you have any control. You can decide whether I put two or three. After that, pig farming is just chaos management. Because it's out of control. You'll wean the, the sows. You'll breed everything that's come into heat. They will farrow. You will have to cope with the piglets. You, it is just management of chaos. You have a choice whether you put two, three, or four gilts in. That is a choice you actually have. And again, using the breeding board, I can, as I've already explained, go back to my 10 and 11 weeks. I can go back and examine the sows that are in that pool. I can walk, and I'm, I'm repeating it deliberately, because it is so important that you must walk the farm week 10 and 11. You must sort out your guilt requirements then, not on the day of weaning, and expect to have had two PERS injections, one parvo, and everything else in the next four days. And then if, if they have problems in the summer, one of the answers to summer infertility is to have more gilts. You know summer's going to happen. It happens every bloody year. So can't admit that you were surprised by it. Oh, it's July. Oh, it's hot. I remember last year it was hot as well. Now, the nice thing living in England, in July, it rains, but it does in, in December. It's cold, but it isn't in December. I mean, England, we don't really, the summer, summer occurs only one day in England, so it's very difficult to farm for the summer infertility effect. Oh, we all want to live in Spain, and most of us now do. <laughs> God knows what they're going to do being English. Anyway, I'll be critical. We heard this morning, these, these slides aren't actually in your notes. We heard this morning about um, cooling. One of the problems that I find very frustrating in Asia is we have systems and we don't bloody make that maintain them. We put, a, we, put a, we put a evaporative cool cell in and half the cell doesn't work because nobody bothers to clean the, clean the jets. We put, a wet, we put a drip cooling system in place and it doesn't drip, it pours. So this is, this is my bore stud. This one is pouring, the next one was dripping, the next one wasn't working at all. How can that be considered a, a, a heat? Don't worry about it. it. By the time he gets the lights out, we'll be coming to the next slide. This one here is on. You maybe can't tell there's no water coming out of it. And this one here, you, I can see it perfectly, but I know you can't. There's water literally pouring out of that dripper because the dripper's burst off, and now all that's happening is water is just pouring onto the back. The Japanese used this as a torture method in the Second World War. We really expect to have good performance torturing that sow. I've had sows go crazy because the water ran into their ears. Drip cooling is what it is. Use it. Don't abuse it. So who's in the breeding group as well? So I record the wean sows, bred sows, that was that, that, what that means by that is the sows that cycled within seven days, the returns, and the gilts. Because it does matter. Here on this farm, we bred 24 sows. When you did your calculations, the numbers said 24 sows. But unfortunately, what happened in the, in the farrowing was not 20 to farrow. Because the farmer misunderstood the concept. On a normal, normal day, when we have a lot of wean sows, they all come into heat, yet 24 was needed. But you throw in a lot of gilts, so this farm C, we throw in a lot of gilts. Gilts only have a 75% firing rate. You put a lot of gilts into that pool, 
and still hit the 24, you'll not farrow the sows. In the summertime, the farrowing rate falls. If you stick with the same 24, you'll not farrow the sows. Herds have to change. I have a thousand sow unit. What bullshit's that? In the wintertime, it's supposed to be smaller. In the summertime, it's supposed to be larger. I do 32 pigs per sow per year. Well, that's a load of crop, crock as well. What do you mean by the word sow? What do you mean by the word year? What do you mean by the word pig? Because all, I work for breeding companies. We play all of those numbers. What matters is reality. This 50,000 bar for every single one is a disgrace. It's a major disaster on the farm today. This tells me one thing. They're not buying SIVA products. Be very, very wary when you have more, I, have to, I, I am, you know, helping to pay for the hotel bill. Be very, very wary when you have more than 25% of a batch being gilts. As Nicholas said this morning, you put a lot of gilts into the system, what do they do? What they do is they scour. This is a rotavirus problem associated with these gilts. And I'm just showing this as a little, there's, a, there's some new little test kits coming out that you can use as sow side as such. So what we did, we took, took that scour, um, put it into this te test kit, the rotavirus lit up. The litters next door that were normal, the rotavirus didn't lit up. We had a result within 10 minutes, clients very impressed. I'm not saying I believe it, it was just the fact that the test kit was, was nice. We then send the samples away to have them positively confirmed. But it's, these things are useful to try and explain to the client what I thought. It looked like rotavirus, it's a watery diarrhea on day, day two and day three, mortality is relatively low. Um, you know, it looked and felt like rotavirus. It was nice that the test kit also came back um, the way uh, I wanted it. Managing the gilt pool. So this goes back down to the scour problem. One of the problems with your gilt pool is you've got to get colostrum correct in your gilts. That's why gilts go wrong on farms. And that's about acclimatization, giving your gilts time. I start my gilt pool management at 60 kilos. If you buy your gilts at 105, you've already lost a lot of time. My gilts come out of the finishing unit at 60 kilos. Then they're slowed down, they're vaccinated, they're given time in order to develop. And I, I expose them to the farm. I expose them to a weaner diarrhea, I expose them to nursery diarrhea, I give them rope to try and move uh, PERS, PCV2, Streptococcus, um, Staphylococcus off your tonsils from the nursery to the gilt pool. I use, so that's, this is enteric feedback, that's respiratory feedback, and then I'll use placenta, mummifieds, and, and stillborns as part of my reproductive feedback. So this is parvovirus, maybe a little bit of PERS control as well. Mark, can you come up again, please? This is a minor plea my plea to my Asian colleagues. Now, Mark is a really pretty young gilt. She's probably be around about 80 kilos, or maybe 90 kilos. And what I need to do is I want to introduce Mark into my breeding pool. And so what I'll do is we'll give him a hot cholera vaccine. Then the next week I'll give him a, a Jeskis vaccine. And then I'll give him a uh, a PERS vaccine. And then I'll do a PCV2, a Jeskis, hog cholera, parvo, erysipelas, a trophic rhinitis, a trophic rhinitis, erysipelas, and an E. coli again. Twelve weeks later, Mark, will you cycle for me? <laughs> His answers are F dot dot C, off. <laughs> I mean, what the hell does Mark think I am? I'm some sort of giant mosquito who then suddenly turns around and says, I want to be your friend. Seriously, folks, we've got to seriously think about this, what we're doing. 
We have got to get this sorted out. We cannot have 9, 12, 13, 15 injections in six weeks to these animals and expect them to like us. I'm embarrassed about being a veterinarian half the time. I'm a veterinarian because I love animals. It's a real shame when I go to farms and the, farms, the pigs hate me. I want my pigs to love me as I love them. I want us to use more vaccines and less antibiotics, but not, not at the expense of animal welfare. Then you've got some basic data, which almost all of us would, would agree with. I want to be over 220 days, 130 kilos, 18 millimeter back fat. I mean, this is all, all very nice. But when you buy the pig at 105 kilos, and she's only 140 days, what are you going to do for the next year? And what are you going to do for the next 100 days? But everybody knows all these numbers. But when you actually go to the farm, you find I'm breeding animals at 170 days, at 150 kilos. I mean, the bloody things are monsters. Is she a keeper? Well, we vaccinated her before she's 100 kilos. She has the right genetics. We've put her in a truck. We've delivered her to the farm. We've put her to a boar. And then what did we do? We walked away. We shut our eyes and walked away. You miss the most important part of guilt development. Oh, we put it to a bore that was maybe vasectomized, we talked about this morning. And what I do is I break my sows down into three categories. Those that come into heat quickly, those that come into heat slowly, or in the middle, and those that come into heat late. So the girls who come into heat within 10 days of a bore exposure, truck transport bore exposure, they come into heat. Which one of those groups, you've got one, two, and one, two, and three, which one of those groups has the biggest firing rate? So who thinks that group three, group three will have the biggest firing rate? Nobody? Who thinks group one will have the biggest firing rate? And who thinks group two will have the biggest firing rate? Group two is interesting because you think that you'd spend more time, but it's actually group one. Who thinks that group, now we look at litter size. Who thinks that group three has the biggest litter size? Now this is interesting because she's taken the most time, so she might be the one who has the biggest litter size. Who thinks group one has the biggest litter size? There's a couple of people still playing with me. There is people out there. The lights are difficult to see. Group one has the largest litter size and the largest firing rate. Which ones live the longest? Group one, two, or three? Three, two. Group one is culled at parity six. Group two is culled at parity four. Group three is culled at between parity two and three. Is she a keeper? I apologize to the ladies in the room. Group one, she loves sex. She loves boys. She loves babies. She is the future of the farm. You put her in front of a boy, you put her in front of a boar, she stands, she gets mated, she gets pregnant quickly, she has lots of babies, she loves babies, she has lots of teats, she feeds all her babies, and she comes back into heat on day four or five after weaning, loves sex, loves boars, loves having babies. Group one it likes sex. Majority of the human population is, does not come from majority of the girls. Majority of the human population comes from a very small number of females, those who like babies. The girls don't like babies, they don't produce babies for the next generation. Group three doesn't like sex, not too bothered about the boys. She doesn't come into heat, she's shy about boys. She doesn't want to be mated. She doesn't stand for very long. She doesn't like the babies. They bite on her teats. She kicks them and bites them. She doesn't have good weaning numbers. The best thing to do with group three is to eat them. Now, it's nothing to do with human population. I'm just making a reflection on pigs. Group three should be eaten. 
every pig who doesn't cycle within 30 days of arrival to your farm should go for prosciutto, salami. It should not be part of your breeding pool. And yet, what has most of us done? We introduced the, the pig to the farm, and then we walked away. We don't come back for another month. We don't record any of this. This is one of the most important parts of the guild's life. And as Nicholas has again has pointed out, we can play some hormones, and we can play, well, particularly once we've identified these two, because I would still probably just let nature take its course. But once we've identified these two, then we can manipulate those two to be part of our future. Getting the guilds to cycle. Which heat should we mate on? And as I've said, I like to make my guilds on the third heat. And the number one reason is just because of numbers. There is no financial benefit. Well, there's a negative financial benefit because I've eaten 21 days worth of food. There's no increase in litter size between two and three. There's no increase in, in, in uh, firing rate between two and three. There is between one and two. So the first heat, I do tend to ignore them. But I, what I do is I put a mark on their backs. I color code everything so I can see where my gilts are. So they come into heat, this is a gilt pool. It's the red week. So the girls with the blue and the green marks, I don't even bother heat checking. But it's the red week. I'll put 20 minutes a day into my red gilts. I put five minutes a day into my other colors. I'm not expecting them to come into heat. They're on altrazine anyway. So why they, sh they shouldn't be coming into heat? Because I'm trying to control their, their, for their program. 21 days after her first cycle, she's second cycle, so she has two dots. Hmm. Maybe I might mate her if I, need, if I need her. If I don't need her, I'll wait. What I sometimes do, there is some evidence that if I mate her with dead semen or I mate her with a vasectomized boar, then I start improving the health of the reproductive tract because I'm exposing it to male uh, organisms. Ideally, what I do is I uh, will wait till the third heat. She will have three marks on her. Then I will mate her. This is an ideal op mating opportunity. Or, or, although I don't normally do this, or I will wait. I mean, if I hit 13 pegs and, a 14th, and the 14th gilt comes into heat, I might wait. Don't be greedy. You don't have to mate her. I mean, I'll mate her if, for instance, there's a seventh parity sow in among the 13, because then I'll get rid of the seventh parity sow at six weeks. But that's because I'm thinking. I'm planning the pool. You know what the one thing that goes through most people who breed sows mind when they're breeding sows? They breed the number of sows, whatever's in heat is bred. They're not thinking about the firing rate or how many sows they need. Sows are in heat, so they breed them. There's no more thought processes. They're thinking about the football. I can tell you, they're thinking about how Iceland can possibly win against England. I mean, it's inconceivable. I mean, I'm going to have to worry for nearly a month how the hell can England manage to lose against a population that's the size of some of our small towns. There's 300,000 people live in Iceland. How the hell can we possibly lose? Anyway, we did. <sighs> I think it's not being European. I think that's probably half the... They were in shock. On the other hand, if we've, if we've waited till we've got to four matings, then she has to be mated. As Nicholas quite rightly said, we do not want old, old gilts hanging around the farm. We've got to get on and get rid of them. I'd rather you et them than keep them on the farm. Wait, let, let the new ones coming through uh, work. What you don't need is Jabba the Hutt, for those of you who've watched Star Wars. Jabba the Hutt gilt. She's a fantastic girl, and she even knows it. <laughs> See, when, when a gilt develops that fifth chin, the chances are she's probably too fat. You know, you've got a 250 kilo plus gilt. Where the hell are you going to put her when she's a fourth parity sow weighing 500 kilos, twice the size of the bloody farring crate? And this 250 gilt, is going to eat food, more food than a 180 kilogram gilt. She's going to cost you money, but she is still a very pretty girl. 
So in summary, I have a 100 kilo animal, 105 kilo animal at about 200 days. I do not mate them. Three weeks later, she's about 120 kilograms, 130 kilograms, about 220 days. And that is my first mating opportunity. Ideally, I think all of us would agree, around about 140, 150 kilograms, around 240, 260 days. If you mate those girls, they have a very good chance of getting pregnant. They'll have a very good chance of um, being surviving in the farm. If you have animals that are outside this bracket, you really need to think about getting rid of them. I design special, speciality mating areas for my gilts. I don't put them into the normal uh, breeding pool, but I'm running out of time a little bit. Uh, and then, which is the reason I didn't talk about this was because I knew Nicholas was going to talk about it. What do we do if uh, she doesn't cycle? Uh, well, we have products like Fertipig, we have Altrazine. I'm getting better. And um, so we, have, we are now beginning to, and PG, PGF2 Alpha, we're beginning to actually have more control over our ability to manage these animals. We've got to um, watch the gilt offspring. You've got to be careful about when you're putting these gilts in. There is a big difference between the way that gilt piglets grow and sow piglets grow. There's about a week difference. So that's a week difference to finish. And most people don't, re don't realize that. So you add a lot of gilts into your system, and what you have, you can lose a week of production. <coughs> and what we've found is that this is, this is relevant um, to how, how we can, uh, it's relevant to the colostrum, it's something to do with the colostrum that the gilts give their babies uh, in terms of how they, how they survive. What we also find is that the piglets from a gilt will have three times the mortality rate of piglets from sows. So if your sow mortality rate in the finishing house is 3%, your gilts will be 9. So you add a lot of gilts into the pool and you will affect the, 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 fertility, the um, mortality rate. So for instance, if we take a normal pig flow where we farrow 10, we breed 12, one of those animals is a gilt and we finish 94 pigs, we, will, and we have a 4% pre-weaning mortality because on this example I put 3% of my mortality with sows and 12% with my, oh, we have a 4% post weaning mortality because the mortality came from a few sows and the 12% from the gilts. The same farm, we put a lot of gilts into the system, we have less sows, but now we have an 8% post weaning mortality and it's not real in the sense it's a real 8%, but it's got nothing to do with pathogens. This is, again, purely down to mathematics. You throw more gilts into the system, and what will happen is your post-weaning mortality will go up. That's not an excuse to sell medicines. Understand it. If you get a mycoplasma break on the farm, one of the first things I do is I look at how many gilts did I have in the system. If I have a spike in my gilt pool, the chances are that's the reason why I've got a mycoplasma break, not because of some new pathogen coming to my farm. So this week's outbreak of meningitis may have nothing to do with anything apart from the fact you've got more gilts. And as Nicholas again pointed out, you put more gilts in the system, you get more scour. Put more gilts in the system, you get more meningitis, more greasy pig, more PCV2, more of everything. Now, what I'm going to probably do, I think, is to finish there and take the questions. In the notes, I also include uh, something about breeding, uh, bre breeding gilts. And and while uh, you, you wouldn't have any chance to write, record all of that, have a little look at it. One of the problems with a lot of batch management is the day you start the batch. So for instance, I, I batch every week. Therefore, I cannot use a monthly recording system because it doesn't mean anything. I batch every week. The start day of the week matters. And in simplistic terms, I start the day after weaning. So if I wean on a Thursday, my first day of the week is Friday. If you start the day of the week on a Monday, what's happened is you've included gilts go into the wrong batch and the sows go into another batch. And you can apparently cause variation that actually don't exist. You must make sure that the batch you breed is the batch you farrow. And that takes a little bit of time and effort, but what you can do is to say the simpler way around it is you start the batch the day after weaning. 
So if you wean on a Thursday, you start on a Monday. Okay, this is the future of Asia. So we have beautiful piglets, lots of them, uh, in a nice, cool firing house. Maybe we should be looking at air conditioning our firing houses. Maybe the secret of Asian farming is just to air condition the firing house, let get the girls to eat, and then go on from there. This, is the, this was with one of my farms in England um, two, two weeks ago, where we have 15 piglets. This is the second parity sow. She's not really lost that much weight. You can see she's not a big girl. She weighed 202 kilos, and her piglets at 27 days weighed 117 kilos, 7.7 .7 average, 15 of them. That is a success. This is a Siva pig. I do try. Gilts are the fuel that runs the farm. Thank you very much.